Selective beliefs. We should make sure we do not have spiritual blind spots that cause us to use the Christian faith as a means to honor ourselves. Here's Dr. Gene Getz. This principle relates directly to the apostles. Jesus wants them to hear uh, what he's about to say about blind spots, about selective beliefs. And this was particularly true of the apostles regarding Jesus' death. You see, here in Luke, this is the third time that Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. But they didn't believe it. It went in one ear, it went out the other. They wouldn't comprehend it, they didn't comprehend it. They were so preoccupied with their own agendas, they didn't accept this as reality. And their own agendas basically related to their position with the Messiah. Now, they were surrounded by all kinds of situations and difficulties and persecutions, and they heard all these teachings. But when all is said and done, they still believe that they have a very significant position in the kingdom of God. And they did not understand that Jesus Christ was going to die for the sins of the world, including their sins. So they had selective beliefs. Now notice what Jesus said when He predicted His death. Luke 18, 31. Then He took the twelve aside and told them. No question that who's talking to here. He took the twelve, the, the apostles aside, privately. And this is what He said. See, we're going up to Jerusalem. Everything that is written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. What is he referring to? Well, he's referring to the prophecies regarding his death. And so we have in verse 32, Old Testament prophecies. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked, insulted, spit on. And after they flog him, they will kill him. And he will rise on the third day. He's referring to the Old Testament prophets. They understood none of these things. And you want to say, Peter, have you ever read Isaiah chapter 53? Have you ever heard the rabbis talk about Isaiah 53? Where it says that Jesus would be pierced, that He would be crushed because of our iniquities. He would be despised and rejected by men. Those are words from Isaiah chapter 53. By the way, Jews today, though they have Isaiah 53, in their Old Testament scriptures. They have a real difficult time explaining it. In fact, the rabbis often, as I understand, circumvent that because it's, it's a very difficult passage. Isaiah 53. By the way, I remember being in Jerusalem, the shrine of the book, which was built as a result of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in the caves and they actually found a copy of Isaiah, the whole of Isaiah. They found many of the Old Testament books. And the latest manuscript that they had before the recovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and Isaiah was a thousand years later from when this was actually written. It took us back a thousand years to verify that Isaiah was truly writing this Old Testament prophecy. I remember going up to our guide, and they had a copy of this scroll on a drum in the middle of the shrine of the book. And of course, the Hebrew was all run together. There were no verses. There were no semicolons. There were no periods. And I said, Lior, can you find Isaiah 53? It took him about 10 minutes, but he kept looking and looking, and there it was the prophecies right there that were written. He could actually read the Hebrew that was written all those years ago, thousands of years ago, about Jesus. And so Jesus is saying to these men that He was going to die, and they didn't 
believe it relative to these Old Testament prophecies. Now, here's something I think we need to understand. Notice the meaning of the saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. So it's easy to say, well, they're not responsible. And again, we're introduced to that incredible mystery of God's sovereignty and free will that God had given these men to make decisions. The fact is, from God's sovereign perspective, they were unable to understand. But from a human perspective, the apostles were responsible for their own blind spots. Let me illustrate. James and John, right after Jesus had said this, had an argument as to who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Do you think James and John were responsible for what they did? Absolutely. You can't put that on God. That God blinded them and then held them responsible before Him blinding them. God held them responsible because of their own decision. And what was their decision? They wanted to be right next to Jesus in the kingdom. In fact, they had a family strategy. If you go back in the Scriptures, in Matthew and Mark, you'll find two accounts. One involves their mother who came to Jesus and said, can my two boys sit on your right and the left in your kingdom? And he, she was referring to Jesus as the Messiah in the kingdom, ruling the kingdom. He was the king of Israel, delivering them from Rome. Another gospel says James and John came to Jesus, asked the same question. Well, the fact is they were in cahoots. And the way I like to think about that is that she came first, and she made the request, and then they just stepped in right behind her and said, yes, yes, because they asked the basically the same question. They were asking for status. They were asking for power. Now, remember, this is right after Jesus had taught this truth about blindness, and they immediately appeared in the situation and selfishly tried to do an end run around Peter, tried to do an end run around the other apostles, said the other apostles were uh, very upset with them. They were angry at them because of their human behavior. So here we have James and John, but I think we could say of all the apostles, they were responsible in God's sight for not hearing, not responding, at least not asking questions, not saying, Jesus, what do you mean? Jesus, tell us more about your death. They didn't hear it. They didn't want to hear it. And God held them responsible. So let me restate the principle so we don't lose perspective here. We should make sure we do not have spiritual blind spots that cause us to use the Christian faith as a means to honor ourselves. And that's exactly what James and John were trying to do in their situation, to honor themselves, because they had their eyes on position and power. So here's a, an application question. Why is it so easy, even today, for so-called Christ followers to use the Christian faith to benefit themselves? Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever seen that happen to other people? Now, again, it's not wrong to have a good reputation. It's not wrong for people to look up to us. It's not wrong. In fact, it's right. Because we read that in 1 Timothy, we read it in Titus, that even as spiritual leaders, we're to have a good reputation in relationship to how people view us. We're to be people that, that people can trust because we're followers of Jesus Christ. And that applies to every one of us. But it's inappropriate to assume, and this is the application of the principle, it's inappropriate to assume that just because you say you're a Christian, 
that you believe people should trust you. Now, how does that apply? For example, in business. And I can give you positive illustrations. I can give you negative illustrations. And the negative is that when we use the name of Jesus to manipulate people, to do our bidding, to build ourselves up, to do business, we're stepping over the line. Now, it's a very fine line. Because I can tell you about businessmen that God has blessed in a very unique way because they operate their business according to Christian principles. And God wants us to. But I can also tell you about Christian businessmen that I've met who have used their name, Christian, as followers of Christ to do business, but to do it illegally and to manipulate and control. I can give you illustrations of that. On the positive side, I think of my brother-in-law who was in business in Minnesota, implement dealer, car dealer, and other related aspects to his business. And over the years, he and his brother developed a tremendous reputation where people would drive for miles to do business with them and literally pay more because they knew they were honest. Now, they didn't go about talking about the fact that there were followers of Jesus and you should come to us and do business with us because we're Christians. They just practiced Christianity and everything they did. And God used that. On the other hand, I can tell you about a man in our own city that used the name of Jesus Christ in a manipulative way to do business illegally and to be dishonest. And what a sad story that is. And I think that that's one of the things that comes out of this illustration that God is giving us here in relationship to blind spots. Because I think it's possible that we can even rationalize that and think we're doing the right thing. I've seen individuals who seem to rationalize dishonesty because they're, they're prospering. And they say, well, if, 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 if I weren't in God's will, God wouldn't be blessing me. And at the same time, they're being illegal and dishonest in what they're doing. That shows how easy it is to rationalize and to have blind spots. But when all is said and done, we're responsible. And God wants to search our hearts, wants us to be open, wants us to be honest. He wants us to practice Christian principles in all that we do, but to never use the fact that we're followers of Christ to benefit ourselves. And that's the principle that Jesus is teaching.